guests to settle down. It's 2.08. Uh, this was uh, called, this hearing was called for 2 p.m. Um, again, good afternoon uh, to our resource persons, ladies and gentlemen. This is the 10th public hearing of the Committee on Constitutional Amendments and Revisions of Codes uh, jointly with the Committee on Electoral Reforms and People's Participation regarding uh, proposals to change or amend the 1987 Constitution. We uh, uh, recognize, uh, well, we acknowledge the presence of uh, Senator Bam Aquino, uh, and this uh, public hearing is hereby called to order. Um, may we acknowledge the following uh, resource persons. Uh, we have with us from the Consultative Committee to review the 1987 Constitution, uh, the chairperson of the committee, Chief Justice Renato Puno. We have former Senate President uh, Aquilino Nene Pimentel. We have Associate Justice Antonio Eduardo B. Natura. We have uh, Professor Julio Tihanqui, member of the committee, and also Professor Edmund Tayao, member of the committee. Uh, we also have uh, from the uh, social research institutions uh, representing uh, Social Weather Station, we have Mr. Vladimir uh, Likodine. We had also invited the uh, research director from Pulse Asia, uh, Dr. Uh, Anna Tabunda. Uh, for our uh, reactors, uh, we have with us former Chief Justice Hilario Davide. We also have Associate Justice Adolfo Scuna. So, uh, former Associate Justice Vicente Mendoza. Uh, we have former Commissioner Christian Monsod. We, have, we also have from the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Dr. Rosario Manasan. How do you pronounce that, ma'am? Manasan or Manasan? Manasan, okay. Uh, Prof Professor Jean Pilapil is also here from the Department of Political Science of the uh, University of the Philippines C College of Social Science and Philosophy. Uh, Doc, Mr. Joel Rocamora of the Akbayan Citizens Action Party. Uh, another ComCom -com member who's with us, Professor Eddie Mapag-Ali. Is he here? Sir, thank you for joining us. And Attorney Ferdinand Bocobo, uh, retired Lieutenant General also from the uh, uh, member of the committee, ComCom. -com. We also have Secretary uh, Adelino Sitoy from the PLLO. Oh, and Dr. Uh, Ronald Mendoza, Dean of the Ateneo School of Government, uh, Ateneo de Manila University. Ladies and gentlemen, again, good afternoon. May I uh, just place on record and uh, uh, provide us with the opening statement. Magandang hapon po sa kanilang lahat. This committee started its consultation hearings on the Philippine Constitution, and this representation as chairman, uh, the first, uh, our first committee hearing was last January 17. 2018. Before that hearing, Senator Drillon, who chaired the committee, uh, held two other hearings. A week after that uh, January 2018 hearing, and many of our resource persons were present then, uh, the consultative committee uh, was created and uh, Chief Justice uh, Renato Puno uh, was uh, appointed uh, as head of that committee. Last week, uh, Chief Justice Puno's committee released its report and thereafter, also, SWS released its survey result on federalism and Pulse Asia its own survey on the issue of charter change. In our previous hearings, we had four questions for our resource persons. Do we need to amend or change the Constitution? If the answer is yes, what provisions and why? Who will amend the Constitution, a, con a constitutional convention or constituent assembly? And if a constituent assembly, will Congress vote jointly or separately? Today, in our 10th committee hearing, we want to take a view on chartered change and federalism uh, with, guided by, this draft uh, constitution uh, as proposed by the consultative committee. And our questions, una, sigaw nga ba ng taong bayan ng chartered change? Is there a public clamor for charter change? If so, uh, where is the evidence? Pangalawa, Federalismo ba ang makakapag-unlad sa mga probinsya? 
Is federalism the way to bring more development to the provinces? Or is there, or are there other ways? Pangatlo, bakit tinutulak ang charter change? Sino ang makikinabang dito? Kasama ba ang term extension at no election sa agenda sa likod ng charter change? At sino ang uh, makikinabang or who will benefit from it? Pangapat, ano ang halaga at magiging papel ng draft constitution na ihinanda ng Puno Committee at isinumite sa Pangulo at ang isang kopya ay naibigay sa ating uh, sa Senado at if I understand it correctly, pati rin sa House of Representatives. Ililiwanag ko lang po sa publiko at sa ating mga resource persons na sa ngayon wala pang formal na posisyon ang Senado sa tanong ng kailangan ba ng charter change o hindi. Kung napapanahon ba ito, kung federalismo nga ba ang sagot sa mga problema ng ating bansa, at kung magtsatsatsa man, kon asba o kon kon ang mas mainam na paraan para baguhin ang saligang batas. Tatalakayin pa ito ng kumiting ito at ng Senado sa darating na mga araw. Kaya maganda pong makuha natin ang punto de vista at ang mga paliwanag ng mga membro ng consultative committee. Lilinawin din natin na bilang chairman ng komite, naniniwala tayo na sa ating bansa bilang isang demokrasya, lahat ng punto de vista sa usapin ng charter change, kontra man o pabor, ay dapat marinig sa isang bukas at pampublikong pandinig tulad nito at sa prosesong malaya, patas, uh, dahil sa ganitong paraan lumalakas ang ating demokrasya, at ng malayang talakayan na pundasyon ng demokratikong lipunan. Mahalaga rin ito dahil mas malilinawan ang ating mga kababayan sa usapin ng charter change dahil ang tunay na may kapangyarihan sa pag-amyenda ng saligang batas ay hindi ang Kongreso, hindi ang mga politiko. Ang tunay na may kapangyarihan ay ang mamamayan. Nasa kamay, nasa kamay ng mga mamamayan ang uh, kapangyarihan na pumabor o, he, o kumontra sa anumang panukala, panukala na maaring ihain sa isang plebisito. Yun na lamang po and we will welcome uh, the views of our resource persons and maraming salamat po. Uh, before we proceed, we would like to acknowledge also the presence of Senator Sani Angara, a member of the committee uh, and uh, uh, for ma just to some administrative matters, uh, the process flow will be as follows. We will have the uh, uh, chairman, the head of the cons uh, consultative committee, Chief Justice Puno, to make his presentation uh, on the proposed draft charter, uh, after which uh, we will allow uh, a few others, members, if they may wish to add, uh, to the presentation of uh, Chief Justice Puno uh, and then we will have uh, the response or react, uh, uh, the panel of reactors uh, provide their own inputs that would be uh, Justice Chief Justice Davide, uh, Commissioner Monsod, Chief Justi uh, Justice Mendoza, Justice Oscuna uh, and, uh, and then we will take it from there uh, I will have to balance also the desire of some of our colleagues in the, in the Senate committee to be able to raise questions and, clarific and uh, to make clarifications as we proceed. Uh, with that, unless uh, Senator Baum has an opening statement, Senator Sani Angara, uh, we now give the floor to uh, Chief Justice Puno. Uh, you may proceed, sir, and thank you for joining us this afternoon despite the uh, raining weather. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Uh, Senator. In uh, behalf of uh, the consultative uh, committee, may I uh, express uh, our uh, gratitude for uh, your uh, invitation for uh, the committee to uh, uh, make a, uh, a, uh, a PowerPoint uh, presentation of uh, the significant uh, aspects of uh, the draft uh, constitution of uh, the consultative uh, committee. Uh, we know uh, we have uh, a long uh, agenda, and uh, may I therefore uh, ask uh, Mr. Henrosa, the uh, spokesperson of the uh, committee, 
to uh, make the uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation. You may proceed, uh, Mr. Generoso. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Puno, and Chairman Pangilinan. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we'd like to present, uh, quite uh, frankly, uh, this might be long, but we'll try to cut it short as much as we can. Uh, let me first begin before the uh, presentation on the draft constitution by asking, by ans answering a few questions about the survey. Well, we all know that surveys are media driven that uh, they are time-bound, meaning that they are valid at the time that the survey was taken. That has always been the position of people who conduct surveys. Number two, the CONCOM has just finished its uh, draft and uh, the discussion, the presentation, the consultations, and the debate has just begun. So we would imagine that it will be only in the coming weeks and months that the public pulse will change. Now, to suggest, therefore, that uh, the proposal should be dropped entirely because uh, there are not yet a majority supporting it might be wrong. Because if uh, we would uh, recall, even candidates for political positions do not stop their campaigns when they remain low in the rankings. So if that, ha if that were the rule to be applied, then we might have had a different president in 2010 and a different president today. So it is then a challenge to the CONCOM and the advocates of federalism to expand the public information campaign. Also, if we look at the survey, the survey results could be misleading because in the last Pulse Asia survey, Pulse Asia groups the answers into four, which is yes, now, not now, but sometime in the future, not ever, or don't know. But what Pulse Asia does is that it combines the not now but in the future with not ever, which to our view is wrong because not now is not a rejection, it is not a negative answer, but it is in fact a qualified yes. And in the future, we are not amending the charter today, we are amending it when the final draft is submitted to the people in a plebiscit, maybe one year or two days from today, that is the future. So the proper way to interpret the result is that one and two should be combined so that in reality what we have is that there are 48, there is 48 percent of the respondents who agree to change the constitution. And if you look at the second part of the survey, the federal question, those in favor now are 58, 56 percent. Only the half of that would say not now but in the future. So that, that is how we should look at the surveys. Uh, it, it is not uh, that uh, uh, the qualified year should be treated as negative. It is, in fact, positive. So let me now go to the proposal of the CONCOM, what we call Bayanihan Federalism, a draft constitution for a permanent, indissoluble federal republic, which basically addresses the question of some people that we might be going into a disintegration of the republic. So this is quite uh, explicitly provided for in the draft constitution. Uh, first, let us set the record straight that the 1987 constitution is much better than all our previous constitutions. It has lofty figures that must be retained, and so much of those uh, features have been retained by the CONCOM. But uh, we live in a different world. This is now the world of the Internet. Nobody saw the changes that are taking shape today. And we must be able to adapt to these changes. We must be able to respond to a lot of things happening, not just in the Philippines, but around the world. Now, the unitary system that we have, to our mind, has failed to address most of our problems due basically to the over-concentration of powers in the national government. As a result, we know that development has not taken shape in many of our regions. It is only in Metro Manila and the two nearby regions that development has really taken off in the last 10, 20 years. And poverty cuts across all regions 
except in the three regions. Right now, the poverty incidence is at 26%, which is the number of people living below the poverty line. But then you have another 26% living on the poverty line, which means that 50 to 52 percent of Filipinos are actually poor. That is what the survey also shows. No. So if you look at the development of the country, we will readily see that in areas that have higher share of the gross domestic product, the poverty incidence is lower. That's Metro Manila, Calabarzon, and Central Luzon. You go further away from the center of power and center of economic activity, the share drops dramatically, like in Bicol, it's, it becomes 2%. The poverty incidence is almost 10 times the poverty incidence in Metro Manila. You go to Eastern Visayas, 2% share, it becomes 10 times the poverty incidence in Metro Manila. You go to ARMM, it's less than 1%, and the poverty incidence shoots up to more than half of the population. In fact, in Lano del Sur, where Marawi City is located, the poverty incidence is 73%. 7 out of 10 people in Lano del Sur probably eat only two times a day, maybe even once a day. So this is what we are trying to address. 62% of the country's economic wealth is produced and consumed in only three regions, while the rest of the remaining 14 regions have to share in the remaining 38%. So the unitary system has also produced what? There are remaining threats of secession in Mindanao. There is monopoly of political power by political dynasties. There is monopoly of economic power by business oligarchs and uh, monopolies, oligopolies. There is monopoly of fiscal and administrative power by the central government in Manila. There's unbridled graft and corruption, etc. All these things. These are the problems that we have been facing for the past 120 years. Now, when we talk of federalism, we are not talking of decentralization of power, devolution of power, or delegation of power. Federalism embraces the view that there must be no centralization of power. And in such a system, the governmental powers, the resources, the determination of policies, programs, etc., are properly distributed between the federal government as the central government, in the federated regions, as in our case, the proposal, they are already enshrined in the Constitution instead of being enshrined in a local government code uh, that any time Congress can change and take back all the powers that have previously been granted. Now, how did the CONCOM design this kind of system? First is that it is a concept of Bayanihan federalism where the role of the central government is first to keep the country together, to have enough power so as, so as the country does not break up into different regions. Number two, uh, it adopts a federal presidential system, keeping a system that we are most familiar with and that has uh, uh, worked for the last uh, so many years. It also adopts a more representative legislature, uh, especially in, uh, on the part of the Senate, where uh, the representation will be spread across the different regions instead of the situation now where we have 19 senators from Luzon, three from Mindanao, and only one from the Visayas. It strengthens our constitutional commissions, establishes federated regions that are uh, not only... Uh, economically viable, but will have enough power, both political and economic, to sustain themselves. Four, uh, it makes a more effective exercise of people's initiative. We have, uh, the CONCOM has revised the people's initiative provision so that it becomes uh, easily achievable uh, among our uh, citizens. And Plus, it ensures a permanent, indissoluble nation. So, how do we look at this? The uh, federal government will still be headed by a president under Article 8. There will still be a bicameral legislature. 
a judiciary with four high courts, I will explain later the high courts, and strong independent constitutional commissions. There will now be six constitutional commissions. So what were the significant changes that were made? First, that the president will still be directly elected, except that they will now be elected as a team, both the president and vice president, to avoid the, the situation where in most of my entire life on this planet, I have seen eight presidents, and, and I think there's only been, been one instance when the president and the vice president belong to the same party. So that will change the term from one, sing, one single term of six years to four years with one re-election. There is one uh, reason for that. A re-election exacts greater accountability. If a president anticipates to be to run for re-election, you will see that his acts will be geared toward uh, uh, being more, being able to defend his presidency so that he can uh, seek re-election. So it, it sort of improves the accountability of the people in office. We have also added a new qualification that they must be college degree holders or the equivalent of a college degree. The equivalent refers to executive order number 330 uh, issued by former President Fidel V. Ramos, which allows the Commission on Higher Education to grant equivalent degrees to persons who may not have been able to finish college, but who possess qualification by virtue of experience and training. So it does not close the door on people who have the capacity, but were unfortunate enough to finish college. No. Basically, the President has the same powers, the only power that has been added is the step-in power in all the regions in order to prevent them from separating or when they violate the Constitution or when they do not perform their duties according to the Constitution. The legislature remains, except that, as I said earlier, the senator shall be elected per region, two representatives per region. So that means if there are 18 as proposed, we will have 18 senators. 36, I mean, 36 senators. I'm sorry about that. The House of Representatives will be composed of 400 members. The increase is on the representation of the marginalized sectors. 60% shall be elected by congressional districts. There's about 240 or so districts. The 160 or 40% shall be by proportional party representation where the people elect the political party and the parties that get at least 5% votes will have equivalent number of seats or proportional seats in the House. But for the first three election cycles after the ratification, half of the 160 seats shall be reserved for the five marginalized sectors, that's the labor, peasant, fisher folk, urban poor, and indigenous peoples for their political parties. The idea is to evolve these party list organizations today into strong, full-fledged political parties in about 10, 12, maybe 15 years' time so that they become at par with every other congressman in the House of Representatives. We have also added uh, similar qualifications for the president, the college degree and equivalent, and the powers are basically the same. The big change is in the judiciary, where uh, the CONCOM proposes the creation of four high courts. The uh, design is to have specialized courts that will deal with specific types of cases. And secondly, to, in, to speed up the delivery of justice. We will note that uh, over the past uh, probably half a century, the performance of uh, all the courts in the Philippines has lingered at about 40 to 50 percent, meaning more than half of the cases, whether in the lower courts or in the higher courts, are not decided, and then the cases pile up every day. As of today, there are probably, according to the latest report of the Supreme Court, there are anywhere from 12,000 to 15,000 pending cases in the Supreme Court. So with the establishment of the three other courts, the Constitutional Court, the Administrative Court, and the Electoral Court, a lot of the cases now pending with the Supreme Court will be transferred to the different special courts. 
when the question is of constitutionality, violation of the Bill of Rights, the case goes to the uh, Constitutional Court. When the issue is administrative in character, such as the decision of quasi-judicial bodies, it goes to the Administrative Court. This Administrative Court alone will relieve the Supreme Court of about 2,500 cases pending as of December last year. This, these cases will go to the Administrative Court so that the resolution could be passed there. And then electoral contests involving the President, Vice President, and members of Congress will now be transferred to the Electoral Court, meaning that there will be no more Presidential Electoral Tribunal, Senate Electoral Tribunal, and House of Representatives Electoral Tribunal. Why? Because we also want to speed up the resolution of these cases. It has been the country's experience that uh, cases before these tribunals get decided sometimes two days before the term of the supposed winner uh, is to end. So that we've had congressmen who serve only for two days. And we've had a case of a senator who served for just a few weeks. So in order to speed this up, the electoral court is being proposed. The other feature of the judiciary is the change in how the members are appointed. Today, all members of the Supreme Court are appointed by the President, which has given rise to a time in history when more than half of the Supreme Court was appointed by just one President. In order to avoid that situation, the CONCOM proposes to distribute the appointment of the three high courts to the three branches of government. They share in appointing the members of all the high courts. So one-third will be appointed by the president, including the chief justice of each high court, one-third to be appointed by the commission on appointments of the Congress, and the other third to be appointed by one of the high courts, as the case may be, for instance, to the constitutional court, the appointing authority will be the Supreme Court, and the other court, as the case may be. Now, uh, in order also to speed up the resolution of cases, the Constitution now imposes deadlines for the speedy resolution of cases. In the case of the High Courts, two years from filing of the petition, for uh, lower collegiate courts, it will be one year. And in the case of uh, trial courts, uh, three months after the case is submitted for resolution. It also strengthens the institutional independence of the judiciary by, for instance, uh, uh, making it uh, uh, financially or uh, fiscally independent. The other change in the judiciary is the replacement of the uh, Judicial and Bar Council with the Judicial Appointments and Disciplinary Council, which will now include, as ex-official members, the Chief Justices of the Four High Courts, the Commission, the Chairperson of the Ombudsman Commission, the Civil Service Commission, and the Commission on Audit. The reason for adding the Chairpersons of these uh, commissions is in order to uh, provide the uh, Council with information as to the uh, probable cases that might be pending against the nominees. The COA the, uh, and the Ombudsman will readily know who among the nominees might have cases pending. And on the part of the Civil Service Commission, the Civil Service Commission has its own guidelines on qualifications and standards that might be applied in the selection of nominees. There shall also be a representative from the Senate and the House of Representatives. Uh, today, I believe there is a confusion on that. Uh, because it is not defined whether the representative should come from the House or the Senate or that both of them should have. No? The Secretary of Justice is uh, still there and the Administrator of the Supreme Court. No. How did the CONCOM make the Constitutional Commissions stronger? First, two new commissions will be established, independent commissions. That's the Commission on Human Rights. In the 1987 Constitution, the Commission on Human Rights uh, is uh, part of the article on social justice and human rights. 
It is not in the Article on Constitutional Commissions. So, the CONCOM transferred the entire Article on Commission on Human Rights to the Article on Constitutional Commissions and gave it more powers to cover not only civil and political rights, but also socio-economic, socio cultural, and environmental rights. And to also cover not only violations by the state, but violations by non-state actors. The Competition Commission is uh, the present Philippine Competition Commission created by law, which the CONCOM proposes to elevate into an independent competition commission to give it more power so that we can go after monopolies, cartels, and other uh, market structures that are against fair competition. The other commissions that have been strengthened are the Ombudsman, uh, which is now, instead of Office of the Ombudsman, will now be a commission to be composed of five members, a chairperson to serve as chief ombudsman, and four associate ombudsmen. Again, the reason is to speed up the investigation and filing of cases. Today, it is common to hear of cases by the billions of pesos being dismissed for inordinate delay. With the strengthening of the ombudsman, it is our hope that in the future, no more cases will be dismissed simply because it has been delayed. The other uh, commissions that uh, remain, of course, are the Civil Service Commission and the uh, Commission on Audit. As for the COMELEC, the proposal of CONCOM is for the COMELEC to focus on the administration and management of elections to make sure that all laws on elections are faithfully executed and to regulate political parties. So how did CONCOM uh, develop or uh, formulated the structure of the federated regions? It called for the distribution of powers. The powers were classified into ex exclusive powers for both the federal government and the federated regions. Powers that are shared between them and reserved powers. In the design of the... Uh, federated regions, more powers were given to the federal government rather than to the federated regions. That is again because the design is to have a strong center, a federal government that must be able to keep the country together, what we call bayanihan or holding together federalism. What powers did the CONCOM give to the federal government that shall be exclusive? So. First, anything that has to do with defense and national security, foreign affairs, international trade, customs and tariffs, citizenship, national economic planning, and all these things. I will not read them anymore because we will be distributing copies of this. Uh, these are the other powers. Interregional infrastructure. When infrastructure spans different regions, it shall be the concern of the federal government. When it is within region, then it becomes just the responsibility of the regional government. Okay? Uh, social security, federal uh, crimes and justice system, law and order, and the rest. What about for the federated regions? Within their respective jurisdiction or territory, they will have certain exclusive powers to plan for the economy of their region that will be exclusive to them. But it does not preclude the national government or federal government from having a national economic plan. The creation of sources of revenue, uh, these are enumerated later on what these are, uh, their own justice system for laws that they will enact that are applicable only within the region. They can create their own economic zones. This is important because more than political, the uh, economic aspect of federalism is what will matter in the future. The goal of federalism is to unleash the economic potential of all the other regions we, we have, which have remained uh, dormant for the past 30 years.
That's why it's important that we give them economic power, including the power to create their own economic zones. They will have supervision over all local government units within their jurisdiction. It will no longer be the national government that will supervise the local government units. So instead of the national government having to deal with 1,400 towns, 130 or so cities, 80 or 82 provinces, and 42,000 barangays, the national government or federal government will now have to deal with only 18 regions, and every regional government will have to deal with the local government units within their jurisdiction. It's like a father, instead of uh, having his 10 children living in 10 different dormitories, putting them together in only two or three dormitories, so that instead of sending uh, allowance to 10 dormitories, he now has to send allowance to only three dormitories where all his 10 children are uh, living in groups. So that is the idea. We are actually, the question is asked, what are we federating in reality? We are federating our fragmented town, cities, and provinces. Because for the past 50 years, what we have been doing is divide our provinces and towns in cities. So that today we have 80 provinces when after the war, we probably had only 40 or 42 provinces. And today we have 1,400 towns when probably after the war, we only had less than 1,000 towns and cities. So what are the powers that were given in addition to the uh, ones I enumerated? Business permits and licenses, jurisdiction over municipal waters, cultural language and development, these things. Now what about the shared powers? The CONCOM defined shared powers are those that are not exclusively given to either, whether the federal government or the federated regions. They fall within the relative competency of each of them, and their exercise can be jointly or separately, meaning they can exercise both at the same time, or one can opt to exercise, and the other opts not to exercise. But in case of dispute or conflict in the exercise of these powers, the federal power shall prevail. Reserve powers are powers which are not exclusively given to either of them, no, whether shared or uh, exclusive, and they are not prohibited by the Constitution. And all reserve powers are vested in the federal government. What taxation power did CONCOM propose to give to the federated regions or regional governments? Okay. As a policy, as a general policy, the federal government has the power to levy and collect all taxes, duties, etc., except those that are granted under Section 1, Article 13 of the Constitution involving the federated regions. So, it is also provided for that whether the taxation is imposed by the federal government or the federated region, it shall be uniform, equitable, and progressive. So those fears that there will be runaway taxation by the re federated regions are grossly misplaced, if we might say so. Also, it is explicitly provided for in Section 3 of Article 13 that no double taxation shall be allowed. So those uh, stories that have been coming out in the media for the past few days that the proposal results in double taxation is absolutely false because it is so provided in the draft that no double taxation shall be allowed. So what taxes may the regional governments collect? These are the taxes. The CONCOM studied all the different taxes and fees being collected by the national government and decided on a set of taxes the collection of which may be given for a start to the federated regions. And these are the taxes. The initial estimate of this is that uh, in 2017, for instance, this sum up to about 50 billion uh, nationwide. But of course, the collection will vary 
per region depending on the economic activity in the region. Why, for instance, did we include road users tax and registration of vehicles and transport franchise fees in the taxes or fees to be collected by the regional governments? Let's take uh, a real example. There is a uh, vehicle flying the route of, let's say, Calibo in Aklan and Iloilo City. That UV Express uses only the road in uh, Panay Island. It does not use the roads in Manila. Yet, when the owner of that vehicle pays for his franchise, as well as road user's tax and the vehicle registration, the money still goes to Metro Manila, to the national government. Where is the logic in that kind of arrangement? Shouldn't the money be left in Panay Island? Because, after all, the vehicle only uh, uses roads in Panay Island and only travels in Panay Island. So, these are things that went into the analysis of how these taxes and fees are uh, the, were decided to be uh, given to the regions for their control and collection. Okay. Now, what about the share in other revenues? The CONCOM uh, determined that these are the four top sources of government revenue. Income taxes, excise tax, value added, and customs duties. In 2017, they sum up to about 2 trillion pesos. So the proposal of CONCOM is for these four biggest sources of revenue, the sharing will be 50-50. 50% to be retained by the federal or national government. 50% to be distributed equally among the regions, which will give everyone something like 61 billion. That money, including the taxes that they will collect on their own, will no longer be money that the departments in Manila and the DBM and the Congress will have to appropriate. It will now be in their hands to appropriate because the power of appropriating money is very important in government. The federated region should be given power to use this money, these revenues, to programs and priority undertakings that will be beneficial to their regions and to their constituent units. Then, there is going to be an equalization fund. Why? Because there will still be disparities in the resources of, every, of the different regions. So in order to achieve some kind of balance, an equalization fund is proposed to be established which shall be not less than 3% of the General Appropriations Act. Now, where will this fund go? This will now be distributed to regions in need. So, for instance, if uh, Region 8, Samar Leyte, would want to establish an economic zone, they have 100 hectares of land, but they do not have money to build roads, they can knock on the doors of the Equalization Fund and ask for, say, 5 billion in order to build the road within the economic zone so that they can encourage investors to come in. That is how the, envision, how the equalization fund is envisioned to be used. Okay. What else? The regions will also now have a share of the income from the exploration, development, and utilization of the natural resources within their ter territory. And the sharing is 50% to the region, 50% to the national government, what will the national government do with the 50%? Then the national government may, may decide to distribute these resources to regions which do not have similar natural resources, as in uh, mineral resources or oil or natural gas. No? And, and for the fourth source of revenue, the Congress may still provide for additional appropriation for the needs of the different regions. How will the federated regions be structured? I, th I think I'm down to the last few slides. There will be a regional executive, regional assembly, and a regional judiciary. Very briefly, the regional executive shall be a regional governor and deputy governor. They will not be elected directly, but they will be elected in tandem also from among the representatives uh, elected to the legislative assembly. Question may be asked why? Uh, when uh, CONCOM studied the voting population of every region, 
there are regions where one or two provinces dominate. In order to negate the domination by one province of the governorship of the region, the CONCOM designed a system where there will be equal representatives in the regional assembly so that everyone, whether the province is small or big, whether the city is small or big, everyone will have a chance, an equal chance, to be elected regional governor and regional deputy governor. The regional assembly, as in the design of Congress or the House of Representatives, half will be elected from each province, one per province or highly urbanized or chartered city, and have to be elected in a region-wide election by proportional party representation. Same system as in the House of Representatives. And then the regional assembly is empowered to provide for it their own judicial system. It will not be dictated by the federal government how they will design their judicial system. But of course, the federal judicial system remains throughout the country in every federated region. Now, there are a few special features of the draft constitution. For instance, to address the undemocratic system of our election caused by the dynasties, narco-politics, foreign intervention, the bad character of our political parties, the CONCOM proposes the following. First, in the matter of political dynasties, the provisions are self-executory. They cover up to second degree of relations by blood or marriage. Succession is prohibited, so if the, the father is the mayor, he cannot be succeeded by the wife, the daughter, the son, etc. No multiple positions, whether at the regional or local level. So if there is already a senator, no brother can become congressman, no brother can become mayor, not even a kagawad in the barangay. There will be only two families in the country that will have two positions. That will be the family of the president and the family of the vice president because the CONCOM classified only two positions as national. That will be the position of president and vice president. All the rest are regional, including the senators, who will be elected per region. Even though they serve in the federal Congress, they are deemed regional officials because they are elected in the regions. So there are also self-executing provisions against party switching. No switching is allowed during the term of an incumbent public official. No, he may not switch parties two years before or two years after an election. And there are penalties. You switch parties. If you are an incumbent, you are removed from office. You cannot be appointed to any office until after one election. You cannot run in the succeeding election. And the political party that accepts a political butterfly may also be penalized through the cancellation of its accreditation with the COMELEC. What are the other political reforms? The strengthening of our party system uh, by requiring strong, well-written party ideology, principles, platform, etc., before they are registered. No? Uh, requiring them to exercise democratic processes in the selection of their officials, including candidates. In fact, requiring them as much as practicable to have equal number of women candidates in every election, as far as practicable. No? And then establishing the democracy fund where citizens may contribute anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 in order to finance their political parties or their candidates. And the contribution shall be tax deductible, meaning they will be given tax credit by the BIR. Corporations may also contribute up to uh, 3, million, 3 million, and they will also be given tax credit for that. This will help make political contributions not only transparent, but also to direct political contributions to parties, especially the small ones that need financial support. In terms of addressing the economic uh, side, 
The breaking up of monopolies, oligopolies, and cartels is provided for through provisions that prohibit these uh, types of market structures. Uh, these are, of course, aggravated by the lack of effective representation of the poor in governance. So this is addressed, again, as I said earlier, the prohibition on monopolies and the guarantee of free and fair competition, plus the establishment of an independent competition commission with these powers among others. The poor have been empowered through assured representation in the Congress and regional assemblies through the proportional party representation system with half of the seats reserved during the first three election cycle. To address the lack of foreign investments, the CONCOM proposes to empower Congress to liberalize investments in all these aspects. It is being asked, why not put in the Constitution itself instead of passing on the uh, job to Congress? The CONCOM is looking at flexibility of economic policy. We cannot tie up the rest of the country, the rest of the economic policy for the next 50 or so years or 30 years to a constitutional provision. It is better that depending on the needs of the times, Congress and the executive may be able to adopt certain policies with regard to foreign investment. As for ownership of land, however, it remains exclusive to Filipino citizens, although there might be a, uh, some revisions later on on that. To address poverty of the marginalized sector caused by this, the CONCOM expanded the Bill of Rights to include socio-economic rights, the right to adequate food, education, housing, universal comprehensive health care, and livelihood and employment opportunities. The caveat is this. The state shall adopt measures to ensure the progressive realization of these rights. Meaning that we don't expect government to provide for all this in a year, two years, ten years, not even probably 15 years. But the government is mandated to have continuing progressive programs so that year after year, the number of the homeless shall be reduced instead of growing in number. The number of people who grow hungry every day shall not remain at 20% every time a survey is conducted, but shall be reduced significantly. No? The other is the demandable environmental rights, the right to clean air, water, soil, and surroundings, but more importantly, the right to seek compensation if the, farm, the farmland is damaged by toxic waste from mines. We have seen thousands of hectares of land destroyed by toxic wastes, and the farmers have no recourse. So we are empowering them to sue for compensation. At the same time, we are empowering them to seek relief if in case there are activities that will damage their farms or their source of livelihood, the rivers or the streams or the seas. They can go to court and ask for the writ of kalikasan. Right now, the writ of Kalikasan is only in the rules of court. We want to put it in the Constitution so that it becomes stronger. These are the other special features, very briefly now. The representation in Congress and regional assemblies by the poor. Protect, protection against employment discrimination. In the uh, section on labor and their social justice, the CONCOM added a sentence that no person shall be deprived of employment on account of age, sex, status in life, uh, physical appearance, and other things that amount to discrimination. There is also a section protecting overseas Filipino workers and uh, assuring that they are given legal help when they, need, uh, when they face charges abroad and providing opportunities for gainful employment for persons with disabilities. Free legal assistance for all, uh, for indigents, allowing release on recognizance of indigents accused of crimes which may be uh, allowed uh, to be put on probation, and providing compensation to persons unjustly and wrongfully accused, convicted, and imprisoned, but later on found innocent. The victims of this are mostly the poor because they cannot pay a highly 
Price lawyer for their defense. Uh, just two more slides, sir. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, to address corruption, as I said earlier, the ombudsman has been turned into a commission. I have discussed some of the details of this uh, earlier, so I will not go into the details. Uh, the commission on audit, we have been, we've included, for instance, the power to conduct performance audit, and also in certain cases when requested by an agency to conduct pre-audit so that at the start, the COA will also know, will already know if some of the materials being used for a project, for instance, are overpriced. Instead of finding it out three years later when you can no longer uh, recover the money. So, uh, the Civil Service Commission, no? to, if, to address the ineffective sovereignty, we have the People's Initiative. We will provide you with the details through the PowerPoint presentation. And last, uh, to address gridlocks in certain areas, the uh, Constitutional Court is empowered, for instance, to give advisory opinion either to Congress or the President in cases of an enrolled bill that have uh, significant or what we call paramount national importance. No? Uh, so with the COMELEC in case of uh, uh, a proposal to amend the Constitution. And to ensure the permanence and indissolubility of the Republic, it is so expressed in the preamble that the Republic is permanent and indissoluble. The Republic shall at all times uphold national unity and territorial integrity. Section 2, Article 11 prohibits anyone to advocate, demand, or support the secession of any region from the Federal Republic. There, are, uh, there is the grant of step-in power to the executive. And in the section on uh, amendments, the permanence and indissoluble character of the Federal Republic as enshrined in the Constitution shall not be subject to amendment or revision. Uh, to address, I think uh, much of this has been written, the President shall not be allowed to run the incumbent, to run. Instead of that, uh, the proposal is to elect a transition President and Vice President in tandem. And then they shall be assisted by a transition commission composed of experts in different fields. But the CONCOM has added the following as uh, ex-officio members, the Speaker of the House, the Senate President, the Transition Vice President, and all living presidents. Uh, the first regular election shall take place on the second Monday of May in 2022, assuming that uh, the Constitution will be ratified uh, before that. And then the Commission shall cease to exist by June 30, 2022. That is all. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation.